Hey everyone, my name is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO of Product School. And today I'm here with Jackie Bavaro, who's the co-author of Cracking the PM Career. Hey Jackie. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining the show. I know this is not your first book, definitely your latest one. So why don't you tell us a bit more about kind of your thought process from the original book, Cracking the PM Interview, to now, Cracking the PM Career. Yeah, so um, both this book and my original book have uh, some a lot in common. So um, Cracking the PM Interview was really inspired by my experience of seeing that um, when I applied to be a to be a PM, I got rejected my first time applying to Google. Um, made it in a year later, and then I interviewed hundreds of people. And while I interviewed them, I realized that um, some of the reasons people passed or failed the interview weren't directly related to their skills and how good of a PM they really could be, but were more related to how well they had prepared for the interview and how much structure they added to their answers. Um, and I thought. Um, that if we want to have more great PMs in the world, we should really level the playing field. And any advice I'd be willing to tell a friend of a friend, I should be willing to tell um, to tell anybody on the internet or anybody in the world who wants to buy the book to really make it possible so that everybody has a good chance to become a PM. And I really see the new book as, and I've got, I was going to show my little, uh, <laughs> this is all in a binder format. It's not printed out yet. Um, but I, I would say my idea, but now it's sort of the sequel. It's saying, let's say you've got the job now. Now, how do you succeed as a PM and how do you advance in your career? And just like I saw there were some sort of hidden secrets to the PM interviews, I found that there are also some sort of hidden secrets to succeeding as a PM. There are some like tips and tricks that if you just understood them a little bit better, you could get on the right path. You could build products that uh, that did better in the marketplace, and you would able be able to work better with your manager and with your cross functional partners, and um, and advance so that you can actually get all the recognition that you uh, deserve. So just to give more background on you, you've been one of the most influential product leaders that I know out there. Even before I started product school, I was I was reading your articles. Uh, the, the first book, Cracking the PM Interview, was a total bestseller hit. Still thousands of people read that in order to, to get that first product management job. And, and you mentioned that it's inspired in your own experience as a, as a PM. So why don't you tell us a bit more about your life, you know, before being a PM and then your career as a PM? Yeah. So I, I studied computer science and econ in undergrad, and I'm one of those lucky people who got to go straight into product management. So I, um, I became an intern at Microsoft um, while I was uh, after my sophomore year of college and um, loved Microsoft, uh, decided to go work there full time. And I worked there full time for about three years. And um, when I was moving to New York, I uh, I Microsoft didn't have any PM jobs there, and I love products so much, so I wanted to do that. So I applied to Google. That's when I got rejected the first time. Decided to stay with Microsoft as a uh, Microsoft consultant for a little while, and then switched over uh, a year later to become a PM at Google. Um, loved Google, stayed there for three years, and I one day get a message from a friend I knew from Microsoft saying, "Hey, I'm at this new company. Uh, do you want to have a coffee and learn about it?" And I was like, well, what harm would a coffee do? And that's how I ended up as the first PM at Asana. And Asana was an amazing experience. Uh, I started as the first PM, uh, became head of product management, and uh, grew the team to be over 20 people. So during that time, I got to become a manager. I got to become a manager of managers, um, have all these experiences. I got to write my own career ladders to try to help coach people on my own team to grow. And, um, and absolutely loved it. And then about a year, a little over a year ago, I decided it was time for something new. And that's when I left uh, and I've been working on the book and uh, handling the pandemic and a preschooler at that time too. Totally. Well, and uh, for, for people who don't know, like Asana went public in late 2020. It's one of the most popular tools for product managers. So in a way, you also got to build something for people like ourselves. Yes. Yeah, it's a great tool. I like to think of it as a project management for people who don't like to do project management. Love that. I mean, a constant battle to explain people that product management is different than project management. Mm -hmm. So yeah. in, in, in your case now, as a, as a book author, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's also like a, like a baby, at least in my experience, writing a book as well. So mm -hmm. and, and at the same time, you have experience building digital products. So 
what are some of those parallels between building something physical and building something digital? Yeah. So I think uh, the thing that they have most in common is that in both cases, you should really have a goal. Um, and uh, and you have to sort of understand why are you why are you building this product? Uh, what problem is it solving? Why um, and what will success look like? And exact same thing for a book is why do you want to write this book? What problem is it solving? And um, and what will success look like? Uh, I'd say that uh, some of the bi the biggest difference though for me is that as a product manager, uh, everything you do as a product manager you get done through other people. Uh, you really you work to influence the people around you, influence the designers, influence the engineers, um, and at the end of the day, uh, you're not the person who's sitting there typing the code. So with a book, you get this difference, which is that you actually have created something tangible with your own hands at the end of the day, which uh, can be a nice uh, um, a nice break from the sometimes thankless job of product management. Totally. And now that it's out there, the thing is you can't really iterate it much, right? Like you can go mm -hmm. back to the code base and, and make changes. So obviously there is probably a lot of thinking process be behind the scenes. So you, you notice obviously that there is a need for people to continue growing in their product career after they get that first job. Yeah. And then how do you structure the the course the, the book because I can imagine there are so many different ways you can grow your PM career right yeah uh, great question so the way that we've structured the book is that the first chapters are on the product skills um, and so what I did is I've I talked to lots of product leaders lots of different companies looked at the job ladders and what I found is that the job ladders look very different from company to company every every uh, company groups the skills together differently. But if you if you pull apart those groupings and look at what skills are underneath the groups, uh, they're very consistent from company to company. So I group them as product, execution, strategic, and leadership. Um, but there are lots of correct ways. There's no one right way to group them. So for example, is communication a leadership skill or a strategic skill? You know, you can move them around. But in all cases, you know, the product skill is data insight. Is that strategic or product? Um, but the skills were very common. So we go over those, um, break it down into, uh, you know, many, probably more than 30 sub skills here. Um, and that's the first chapters of the book. We have a whole section on um, people management and what it takes to move into people management and the new skills you need when you're there. And then um, at the end of the book, we have, uh, we really talk about career paths and career ladders. So the skills are the are the individual practices and frameworks um, and responsibilities you need to really succeed at your job. But when you want to translate being good at your job into getting promotions, um, it's not a one to one match. Um, and it's not a one to one match between skills and being good at your job. So uh, what I mean by that is you might have the best possible uh, user insight and data insight, but if you can't use uh, those insights to ship great products that help people and solve problems, then um, then you're not really having the impact that you want to have, and then um, and then that you won't be getting those promotions and you won't be advancing. So in that end of the book, we really talk about what do, what does the career ladder look like? What differentiates a um, an APM from a PM one, from a senior PM, from a, a PM lead and a director, all the way up to head of product? Um, and then we've done interviews with a lot of successful PMs and talked about their paths and what they've learned along the way. Yeah, let's dive deeper into that because I always find it fascinating from the outside that some companies like Google would call almost everyone a product manager, even mm -hmm. if someone will have a lot of experience. So it's hard to decode that from, from the outside unless you know the internal uh, ladder. Microsoft calls some people product managers instead of product managers. So, mm -hmm. you know, for, for people who are not in those companies, how would you describe like the different career ladders? Mm -hmm. ladder? Yeah. So, um, so there's really three phases to what I've what I've learned through this research is there's three phases to a PM's career to a career in product. So the first phase is the PM phase, and that's when you're focused on shipping products. Um, the and so and this is a lot of like when you think about your PM interviews um, and what you might be doing for your first five years as being a product manager, it's really all about shipping great products. It's all about you know. Researching what uh, researching the customers, uh, validating your designs, maybe running A/B tests, analyzing them, iterating, improving, and shipping things that are successful. Um, and you get better and better and better at that. 
But to get to senior PM, there's actually the role, the role changes. And you don't get to senior PM by just becoming better at shipping product. You get to senior PM by getting better at product strategy. So that means not just um, how do we set, take this product and ship it really well, but what products should we be building? What goals should we be going after? Uh, what should we set our roadmap? What's our long-term vision? How do you set a long-term plan that will help your company win in the marketplace? Um, and that's that's a new set of skills and a new set of work that you do as a senior PM that as an APM, you might not have even realized existed. And it's sort of interesting as a new PM, when you look at the, the senior PMs on your team, uh, you might you might not you might wonder like, oh, what makes them a senior PM? I don't see what they're doing. That's so great. And that's because a lot of it is behind the scenes. A lot of that is going to be the strategic work they're doing, the strategy they're creating, the times that they go to an executive and they convince them to that we need to hire people who know AI so that we can be ready for the moves we're going to need to make two years from now. Um, and so you get better and better at product strategy, deciding what your what your company needs to do to win in the marketplace. And they say, great, I reached the top. There's nothing else to learn. Um, but it shifts again. And there's the third phase of product uh, careers, which is organizational excellence. So once you move into people management, um, the, the, the focus now is not on shipping great products or creating um, product strategy, but instead on building a high performing team that can create good strategies and ship good products. So now the role really becomes about hiring people and uh, coaching and developing people, setting up processes, helping uh, different departments at the company work well together, removing obstacles, um, finding these, these huge multipliers on your team's success that will help the, the whole company succeed, even though um, without your, having your fingers in on every little product decision. And what's interesting is some heads of product will still uh, be very, very involved in product review and making those small tweaks. And, um, and so as an APM, let's say, when you think of what your head of product does, you might think that most of their job is this feedback you're getting in product review, that most of the job is the, uh, is the way that they like knew exactly how the design should work or that kind of thing. Um, but that's really a small part of their job. And the larger part of their job is building the team and coaching the rest of the company on company strategy. So for people who, let's say, enjoy getting their hands dirty and being in the front line with engineers, designers, mm -hmm. and they may not want to become a head of product and, and, and build teams, but they still want to grow in their career. I've seen that there are options. Uh, I've seen people mm -hmm. call uh, pr principal product managers, product leads. So what is your, your take on, on the, that type of career? Yeah. So, um, so what I found is that um, a lot of a lot of job ladders have some level at which it's okay. So the two things: one is that there's some level at which it's okay to not continue advancing. So, um, so for example, you can't. You, most companies will not let you just hang out at APM for ten years. You know, if you if you're on your eighth year as APM and you haven't graduated to be a PM one, uh, they're going to say, "Hey, let's you know." great work, but like, I'd rather have that headcount spot for someone who's going to be growing faster. It's really meant to be a training job that you hire people in and grow them. Um, but for most companies, senior PM is around the level where if you're a senior PM, you're a high performing member of the team, you're independent. Um, you create, you create a lot of value on your own. And for example, if, if work-life balance is more important to you at this point in your career, if you have a side project that you're really passionate about, Um, you could spend your entire career as a senior PM and, um, and the company would be really happy to have you and you don't need to continue to get promoted to stay at a company. Um, and really career success can mean such, so many different things to different people that that's an entirely valid approach to your career. Um, and I think that uh, if you make it that far, you should be very proud of what you've done and you shouldn't feel extra pressure to just take on new responsibilities. Um, and then there is the principal PM role. So the, the title between senior PM and principal PM can vary from company to company, but generally what distinguishes a principal PM is that they are an expert in their industry. So they're not just the, here's a, there's a few things, but so they're not just the best in their company at something, but actually they're well-respected in the industry at having been the, being the person, the go-to person in the industry to understand a concept. Um, Another part about being a principal PM is they're generally, to become a principal PM, you need to join a company that has a business need for a principal PM. 
So that means they have a business need for somebody who is so advanced, so strategic, so excellent at product skills, execution skills, product strategy, um, and that the the size of the work that uh, that they need to be responsible for to create a large impact that justifies their high salary, um, that that can be done with a small enough number of engineers uh, that you don't need to be a people manager. So in the product careers, a lot of times people become people managers because it's going to take 50 engineers to build your product and one PM can't uh, can't lead that many engineers. Um, but some places where uh, principal PMs are very valued is, for example, in high stakes partnerships. So, for example, if uh, if Yahoo and Microsoft are partnering on something, that's the kind of place where you will really want a principal PM because the actual amount of product work is small enough for a few engineers to handle, but you really can't afford anything going wrong. Yeah, and I noticed that trend. When, when I started product school, there wasn't really that much definition around this. It was like, okay, you want to work in product, great. You are a product manager. And the product team is the product manager. And now we're seeing this entire ecosystem of, first of all, careers for product people, but also different, I would say, hybrid roles. I've, I've seen a product operations people, product design, product marketing. So how are you thinking about also these kind of structures that, that we are seeing as, as the product evolves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that's probably the the... The future of product, I think, is really going to be that there's going to be a lot more product managers. And that doesn't mean that um, not every com every company, especially small ones, can't afford to have an extra person who only does product management. So I really think that people from many different roles are going to start learning and picking up PM best practices. These, these kinds of product best practices like think about your goals before you start the work. Um, it's kind of obvious, but that's the sort of thing that product managers are really trained in. Um, and I think we'll start seeing lots and lots of roles can benefit from that that mindset. I agree. I think it's a mindset, regardless of your title. And uh, and I see now this this other trend called product led growth or product led businesses. How companies are trying to lead with their product. And I've seen more companies having a chief product officer, which before it wasn't that obvious. I, mm -hmm. I product in some cases used to report to marketing or used to report to technology. I've seen a, a, lot of, a lot of CEOs that come from a product background. So I think all of those trends are pushing in, in that direction of elevating the role of the product manager. Yeah. So what is in the, in the career ladder, uh, in, the, in the PM career, what is the kind of like the ultimate step? <laughs> uh, I think I think there's lots of different directions. So I think if you were going to go with a, a normal straight career ladder, I would say probably head of product, which becomes not just uh, being responsible for product managers, but also designers and um, researchers, and depending on the company engineers, or the, they could be separate. Um, but that's really just the traditional path. I see a lot of people uh, choose other careers after product management. Um, so for example, uh, one really interesting role is general manager. So I mentioned head of product might be responsible for the PMs and the engineer, or sorry, the PMs, the designers, and maybe the engineers. A general manager of a business unit is responsible for those people within a department, but also um, the sales and the marketing people, all of the all of the different departments together. Um, so they're really considering um, the both the profits and the losses and everything it takes to bring a pro a, a, a product to market successfully. Um, so that's one of the general manager. Um, people also tend to go into various roles in venture consulting. Um, I see people move into product coaching. Some people move into chief of staff roles, although that's a title with an even more ambiguous uh, ambiguous title than product manager. So um, there's both very junior and very senior chief of staff roles. Um, yeah, so there's a lot. There's a lot of different things that you can be set up for, and then of course uh, CEO role, CEO roles and founder roles. Maybe that's an idea for your future book, the, the life after the PM career. Yeah. So um, in your case, I'm also very interested in, in learning how people learn. So the mm -hmm. same way you describe how you kind of fell into product, how did you learn the skills to truly become a product leader? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Um, there's one framework uh, that I was kind of, as I was, I was reflecting on this for the book that I put together that I really like, which I call uh, like notice, assess, and improve. Um, 
And what I found is that, so I think the best way to improve as a PM is to get feedback um, and especially feedback from your peers, feedback from your managers, and also feedback from your manager's peers. So if you're at a larger company, for example, the other PM managers are a great source of feedback. Um, but a lot of the time, the feedback that, that you'll hear as a PM isn't very actionable or it doesn't seem actionable at first. So you might hear like, you need to be more strategic or you need to be more on top of problems on your team or you need to not let the dates slip or whatever it is that you hear. Uh, when you first hear it, maybe it doesn't resonate with you and you're like, that doesn't, like, and, and sometimes you're like, you're wrong. Like, no, you misunderstood the situation entirely and that feedback is like unfair and invalid. Um, but if you split it up into notice, assess and improve, what you can say is first uh, notice means find the situations where this feed where this feedback might be applicable. Um, like what are the cases where um, the person giving you feedback thinks that you had a problem here? What's the pattern? And on that very first step, when you start to look at the pattern, um, a bunch of you might see a bunch of different things. One of these might be that you you didn't even notice these situations. So maybe somebody says, you have a lot of miscommunication. Um, and you're like, when? And they're like, well, in that last meeting. And you're like, what? <laughs> so the first step there might just be learning, be like, okay, can you please just like give me, give me a signal, you know, touch your ear every time, every time I like have a miscommunication or touch your ear every time I interrupt someone or whatever it is, the skill that you're trying to notice. So first just gathering this large bank of examples um, and training, training yourself to notice these situations. Um, and then the second step is to assess. So um, one thing that might happen is maybe you were noticing all the time that, um, for example, uh, that your project was late or that your, your dates kept slipping. Maybe, you're, maybe you were very aware of that, but they thought that they just slipped because you made a mistake, but actually you had made a really intentional decision to move the date in each of these cases. And so something went wrong because they, they weren't happy with how it went. But the problem that they that they named might be a little bit different than the, than the way that you want to frame the problem to work on it. So maybe the problem from your point of view isn't that the date slipped. The problem is that you didn't um, loop in the stakeholders when you were moving the date and you didn't get enough buy-in and you didn't persuade people about the date. Um, so there you might say that the problem wasn't your judgment on or your execution skills on getting your team to ship as fast as possible. The problem was really the communication skills. So when you're able to reframe, go back to the person who gave you the feedback, double check if that could be true. And then you can work on that final step of how do I improve? How do I like set up what I want to do, set a goal, practice it, and then go back and check with someone if it improved? It's sort of a long way of saying how I think you can kind of make the most out of the feedback you're getting so you can advance as fast as possible and improve your skills as fast as possible. I find it fascinating because feedback is a very overused word. And I think that breaking it down into actionable items that are good for you to deliver, but also important for the other person to interpret. Because sometimes the, the way that message can land is very different than the intention that the sender has. Mm -hmm. And I think I've, I've tried to learn that the, the hard way. Sometimes we, we mean well and create the opposite effect. So I think that creating frameworks is, or systems, it's in a way what, what is expected mm -hmm. from a product leader. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of templates out there, but at the end of the day, you probably have to customize whatever works for you and your team. Yep. <laughs> so now that obviously you you had you you, are, you achieve the ultimate step in in a, in the product career, and you had to coach other people, it's very meta because you train the, the trainers in a way. How about mentorship and help outside an organization? Um, is it the question, you know, how can people do that or? Yeah. So for, yeah, it's, is that valuable? Is it something that you personally do? Yeah. Yes. So I think that, uh, mentoring is, is very important, uh, for two reasons. Um, one is that if you do have aspirations to be a people manager, then mentoring is a prerequisite, um, is that being a mentor is, is how you demonstrate those skills and build that trust that you'd be a good product leader. But even if you have no interest in people management, uh, mentoring is how you can give back to the community, um, and especially because we are uh, we're still in the very early days of product management as a career. Um, you're able to have a very very large impact on the world and across companies if you are able to help mentor other people. Um, different types of mentorship are are um, one thing I've learned is that 
people are very are interested in different types of mentorship. So some people really like one-on-one -on -one mentoring with someone. Some people like to get groups together. Some people like to do uh, like put together a big presentation of what they've learned and take it on the conference circuit. Some people like to tweet. Some people write to like blog articles. Um, and uh, so if, if you're looking for a way to give back to the community and to mentor people, uh, what I would say is that you uh, you don't need to fight your personality. <laughs> it's it's okay to pick the the approach that that really calls to you, the one that feels like less work to you, the one that um, that you enjoy doing the most, um, and use that to go forward. Um, and if you are doing writing, um, the thing that I think that the community needs a lot more of is uh, is stories about real product management. So if anybody out there is listening and wants to wants to contribute, I think that. Um, there is so much valuable that even a, a fairly new PM can have. If you just tell the story about a product decision you made and how you thought about the choices, the interesting things you learned and how it turned out, and maybe what you learned uh, after that and how you have done it differently. Um, I think that uh, each of those stories is valuable. And so there's no, there's no chance of the world being too filled with that stories. Everybody will love to, to learn those specific ones. And, it's, uh, and you really are the expert on your story. Um, and you can kind of work with your company to make sure that you're uh, keeping it as uh, you're not giving away any secrets that they don't want you to. I like your point on uh, picking the right format for both the, the, the teacher and the, and the student. Because at the end of the day, I think part of lifelong learning is that you have options. You can try. You can do this. You don't have to overcommit. You can do this on the side. You can change if something stops working for you. And, and I think we, we went from there is nothing out there or very little to oh my God, there's probably too much information. And now it's important to also curate and filter those, those sources because mm -hmm. there's good product management and definitely your book is a really good source. But I've also seen very contradictory advice that can create a lot of confusion in the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes there's things that apply in one case, but not another. Yeah, and, and part of it, I think it's because there wasn't really a playbook. So a lot of us are trying to create that playbook by also piggybacking on others that have experience in different industries. And, and I think it's beautiful that we are co-creating these new industries and, and good practices for the rest of the world, taking a product mindset, knowing that some of the things that we were saying many years ago might be different and that's okay. And at the same time, we cannot do this alone. I don't think one person has the single truth on, and here is how you do product. Yeah. So what is, uh, what is next for, like, what is the goal with, with the book? Obviously, you are about to launch, and I appreciate your time. You've been giving back to the community since the very beginning. I think the first time you participated at one of our events was 2018, and your <laughs> author, Gail, participated in 2015. So I'm very appreciative for, for everything that you do for, for us and for the community. Kind of what is your own goal with, with this book? Yeah. So yeah, so the book Cracking the PM Career is coming out next week and it's it's a uh, you can pre-order it on Amazon now if you'd like and we are working on the layout for the Kindle version so that will be not too far after. Um and in terms of the goal for the book, there's a few different goals we have, but uh one of the ones uh that I really like is so high level my goal for the book is to create more great product managers in the world. Um, because I want there to be more good products in the world. <laughs> and um, every time I see a product that has a terrible UI, you know, I feel I'm like, oh, I wish they had a better product manager there. Um, but also there are these products where the entire product and the thousands of hours people put into it fails. You know, I was, I was thinking about Quibi recently. And so many people put so many, so much effort and so much energy and so much love into that product. Um, but it was, it was sort of some of the premise was flawed from the start. And better product management, I think, could have, could have, uh, prevented that waste of, of energy. So, um, so I'm really hoping that through the book that, um, that more people improve their PM skills, that we create better products. And, um, and again, I'm really hoping to level the playing field so that the people who are really skilled and so the people that are the best at their careers are able to get a fair shot at, at, um, at expanding their scope and their impact and getting the promotions they want so that they're able to have as much influence as they deserve. I agree. And, and I think one of the beautiful things about having this content uh, very affordable for the rest of the world is that it's not a secret in Silicon Valley anymore. Yeah. I, I remember come, as an outsider, I used to think that, oh my God, I need to be in Silicon Valley. I need to meet someone from Google in order to learn. And now they can come to your house. Yeah. So all of that democratization of education, I think ultimately benefits the world to make better products. And um now I think for us, we have a big responsibility 
to, <laughs> to continue uh, updating some of those mental models that maybe were useful at some point and now they are changing. Like for me personally, I just don't understand why we keep talking about agile so much when this is something that was invented 20 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, so what do you think is the kind of the, the future? How is this product management uh, discipline going to evolve? Going to evolve, yeah, yeah. And just to uh, to touch on agile for a second, um, and we had, we had talked about you and I had talked about this a little bit before the concept of like what role does project management have in in product management? And I think what I found is that product managers spend so long being like, I'm a product manager, not a project manager, that then when it comes time to do some project management on your team, you're like, no, I can't do it. It's not my job. Um, but, a, but, but to have your team be successful and be able to ship products, you do need to do some, um, some project management.